All right, I think we'll get started. Uh, so let me welcome you this afternoon to today's event, The Importance of Inclusivity for Peace Building and Sustaining Peace, co-hosted by the International Peace Institute, Sophia University in Toko Tokyo, Kakeni, the One Earth Future Foundation, and the Permanent Mission of Japan. Locally owned inclusive processes to prevent the outbreak, escalation, continuation, and recurrence of conflict are now widely accepted principles of engagement in conflict prevention and peacekeeping. This call for inclusive national ownership of peace building policy and practice has grown louder in recent years with the focus on sustaining peace. Yet while there is a consensus on the importance of locally focused approaches to peace building and sustaining peace, translating these principles into practice is an enduring challenge for the United Nations, international, other international organizations, and national governments. Later this month, IPI will publish the results of a two-year project examining community-led peace building networks in eight countries with the aim of developing approaches for more inclusive and integrated peace building and how they can be harnessed to improve peace building efforts globally. Today's policy forum will discuss the value and challenges surrounding inclusivity within peace building and sustaining peace, including how the international community can better engage with local peace builders in an inclusive manner in order to sustain peace. Before introducing our speakers, who will examine this issue from several different angles, let me first invite Fabrizio Hochschild, Assistant Secretary General for Strategic Coordination at the United Nations to make opening remarks on how the UN is addressing this priority. Fabrizio. Thank you, uh, Jake. Um, I'm very fortunate to be able to, to be here together with uh, Professor Higashi Hassini and uh, Ambassador Kawamura. And of course, uh, all of you, many of you, dear colleagues and friends. I mean, there are different statistics, but they're all alarming. And I'm referring to the number of conflicts that reach a peace deal to resolve them, and then conflict resumes. Uh, the lowest statistics I've seen of conflicts resuming post-peace deal is around 30%, 30% failure rate, and the highest I've seen go up to 70 uh, or 80%. So our approaches to conflict uh, resolution um, may at times be adequate to getting signatures uh, on a peace deal where the parties pledge to lay down their arms, but seldom um, uh, seem adequate to actually ensuring a sustained peace uh, that leads to um, resolution of the root causes and lasting changes in, um, in a country that assure uh, a future without conflict. And of course, there are multiple reasons behind the resumption uh, of conflict. But one that I think an increasing number of studies over the years has shown, one is that peace deals made among men who are self-named representatives of uh, those who took up arms in, in the name of this or that cause, those peace deals where they're just made in uh, closed off chambers um, among a small group of uh, conflict actors are unlikely to be uh, sustained. And processes that are more inclusive, that bring in those most affected uh, by conflict, uh, are much more uh, durable. I mean, I had the privilege to be involved in one such process, the Colombian process, which was an interesting mixture because it was an offshore process in Cuba uh, where, in fact, the negotiators were quite insulated and isolated uh, from their communities. At the same time, there was a very concerted effort, which the UN played a major, major role in supporting, to bring in the views of civil society, to bring in the views of those 
from conflictarians to bring in the views of the marginalized uh, groups such as indigenous uh, populations or uh, what, what in Colombia referred to as Afro uh, de descendants and above all women. And we organized a number of major consultation play processes with literally thousands of people in Colombia. And we also organized a series of visits to Havana uh, of women's groups, um, of uh, victims uh, above all. And this had a twofold uh, impact. Number one, it greatly increased the legitimacy of the peace process because it linked it to those who are affected by conflict. It linked it to those who are most uh, uh, affected by the fallout of conflict, the victims of conflict. But secondly, it also greatly improved the quality um, of the agreement itself because the consultations we had uh, in Colombia fed into um, the negotiations in terms of proposals for resolution of many of the issues that were under uh, discussion. So I think that's one model that is well worthy of study of how an inclusive uh, process um, can um, both be more legitimate and uh, contribute to ensuring that peace is more sustainable. There are many efforts by the UN to bring in um, uh, marginalized groups to make processes more inclusive. I'm thinking of what Stefan de Mistura has done by constituting a women's advisory group for, for, for his work um, in on the Syrian peace process, uh, of what he does to bring in civil society uh, groups. I'm thinking of the work that PBSO does in so many different parts of the world, uh, funding national consultations with groups to feed into the peace process. Uh, I was in Central African Republic where there was an important initiative by, funded by the Peace Building Support Office um, in that regard. And of course, that is the aim um, the, to increase that. And that is one of the reasons the Secretary General, as part of his reform, wants to strengthen the Peace Building uh, Support Office precisely to give us better tools to make processes um, more I inclusive. But of course, there's much we can still learn. There's much that can be still be done. And I think precisely this sort of exercise, and I'd like to congratulate Japan um, and uh, IPI for, for, for taking this on um, so that we can learn how to do this better on the basis of case studies and on the basis of the sort of discussions that will happen here today. So uh, I, I, I wish all a very productive uh, discussion, and this really goes to the heart uh, of what is most important to the Secretary General and to the United Nations. Thank you. All right, so we're going to, for those of you who have been to IPI policy forums, usually you know that at this moment we invite the panel up. We're going to deviate slightly from our, our typical format because Dr. Higashi has a, a visual presentation. So I'm going to introduce our speakers from the floor and then after the visual presentation we'll we'll invite the speakers up to the uh, up to the table. So our first speaker today is Dr. Daisaku Higashi, who's professor, deputy director of the Center for Global Cooperation and Training at Sophia Institute of International Relations, Sophia University in Tokyo. Uh, next, we have Dr. Connor Sale, who's Director of the Peace Through Governance Program at One Earth Future Foundation. And Ms. Hassini Haputhanthri, author of the Sri Lanka case study in IPI's Local Networks for Peace, Drawing Lessons from Community-Led Peace Building Series. And with that, Dr. Higashi, you have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you very much for coming to today's event. Uh, I also appreciate IPI and uh, uh, colleague, uh, including Marianne, who kindly hosted these uh, seminars. I also appreciate uh, Fabrizio SG for the strategic uh, coordination and Ambassador Kamura of the Japanese Mission to the Nation who kindly come to this event. Uh, I'd like to make a kind of four point for today's uh, presentations. One is about my argument about inclusivity and the legitimacy, which was written in my books, which I, which I published two years, three years ago. And also I'd like to make some today's argument on the reason of the political exclusion and by in, using some case study like South Sudan, Syria, and Iraq, and I'd like to make some conclusions. 
Uh, let me introduce a little bit about myself, which is related to my today's presentations. I started my career as a, a program director for a Japanese public TV company and produced many documentaries on the you know, conflict, including a Vietnam War, Middle East Peace Talk, uh, North Korean Nuclear Crisis. And I produced a even Iraq Challenge of the United Nations, which got silver medal from the Correspondent Association. But I really want to be expert on the post-conflict peace building, so I quit my job. At, at the age of 35, and I started my master and the PhD in the political science at the University of British Columbia. Uh, and uh, after I did my field of research, Afghanistan East Timors, I was appointed as a team leader for reconciliation and integration in the INAMA, UN Assistant Mission in Afghanistan. And uh, after I go back, uh, and I became a professor at the University of Tokyo and completed my PhD from Canada University. And I was appointed the Minister Counselor in the Japanese Mission to the United Nations here in the New York and directed the team of the Peace Building Commissions. And after returning to my university, I published this English book and I got an offer from uh, Sofia University to the tenure positions. And in terms of the, my argument of the inclusivity and the legitimacy, which is written in the, my book, uh, I'd like to explain the definition of the legitimacy first. And the Thomas Frank famously argued that the legitimacy exerts a pull to compliance, which is powered by the quality of the rule or the rule making institution, and not by the coercive authority. So, legitimacy actually exerts claim to compliance in the voluntarist mode. So, if that's the case, legitimacy government is a government under which the majority of the people obey with its rule and institution not by coercion, but by the conviction that compliance is the right thing to do. So once the government in the post conflict setting become legitimate in the eye of the local peoples, they are very likely to achieve sustained peace and stability within the state. And I argue in my book, maybe there are four key actors in creating a compliance and maybe creating a legitimate government in the long run. First is the role of the United Nations. Second is the inclusiveness. The third is the resource distribution, you know, how to improve the living conditions of the peoples. And the fourth is the level of the forces, including the military and the police. And in terms of the role of the United Nations, the uh, United Nations, of course, is not the perfect, but it seems to be the UN has some comparative advantage uh, compared with member states in terms of the uh, creating a sense of the impartiality, which could support a compliance to like election, constitution, demobilization. And if you have repeated compliance, maybe it create a legitimate government. But if you have a repeated non-compliance, it uh, government will be loaded. And in terms of the inclusiveness, I argue that lack of the inclusive political process in post-conflict state tend to result in the relapse of the conflict in a quite relatively quick manner. And I argue that many case studies actually support uh, these assertions. And so maybe there's kind of consensus in the UN circle that inclusivity is one of the most important factors in the peace building. But the question is why it's so difficult. And they, I thought that it's important to study why does political exclusion happen at the first place. So I started my field of research on this issue from 2016 and studying uh, several cases like South Sudan, Syria, and Iraq. And uh, I'd like to make two temporary arguments today about major reasons. One is uh, exclusion happens when one side or both sides are afraid that if they included enemy into the political process, they would be defeated by elections and maybe marginalized politically and economically and even could be punished. So in this case, it might be vital for credible mediator to ascertain security, participation, and inclusion of all conflict parties to, to the process. And second reason could be uh, exclusion happen when one side of the military conflict is convinced that they can win the war and maintain the entire territory by military power. So in this case, it's vital for the international community to convince a winning party of the importance about the inclusive political process to avoid the relapse of the conflict. <laughs> and the, I also want to argue a little bit about the importance of inclusivity the mediation during the conflict. And I think uh, many study and reports suggest that including many parties to a negotiable table might not necessarily mean that they are more likely to create a peace agreement. But however, it's crucial for the peace agreement to have some component which ensure the inclusion of the almost all group into the nation building process after the conflict and the, to avoid the, the relapse of the conflict. 
And uh, let me explain some case study which I'm doing now. Uh, first one is South Sudan. As you know, the South Sudan was independent in 2011, but Vice President Dick Machar was fired in 2013, and the civil war started in the end of that year. There was peace agreement between the President Kiyo and the Vice President Dick Machar in August 2015, and then Dick Machar returned to the Juba, and transition government was formed. But only three months later, a military crash started again, and it resulted in the civil war in July 2016. And now there is a, a high-level liberalization forum made by IGAT, which tried to stop the civil wars. So I interviewed, I conducted field research in 2016, 17, 18, and they interviewed many UN special envoys, uh, uh, as well as uh, high rank official of AU and the IGAT, which are you know, mediating the South Sudan peace process. And also interviewed like a South Sudan ambassador to, uh, to AU in the Ethiopia and also South ambassador in the Kenya and also several prominent opposition leaders uh, both in the Kenya and the uh, Ethiopia. And in, t in, in terms of the claim in the August 2016, just after the crash of the Juba in, two, you know, in July 2016, uh, James Morgan, South Sudan ambassador uh, to the AU, told me that Dr. Marshall, you know, vice president, is actually an obstacle to the peace. And the Peter Adwork, advisor to the Dick Rich Marshall, told me that we should overthrow the uh, Kia government politically and militarily. So there was no space of the compromise in the time of 2016. And uh, many mediators uh, told me in the August 2016 that the relationship between President Kiers and the former Vice President Machar is not the relationship with trust anymore, but the relationship of the, of the hatred. You know, they hate each other. But it actually resulted in the, like a very harsh fighting and uh, resulted in the more than 2 million international refugees and the 2 million internal displaced people only for the one and a half years. So I went to the Uganda this March to interview the South Sudan refugee, and it's a very shocking that uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people uh, come to the Uganda from South Sudan every day, and that they lost everything, like a car and the resources, because of the fighting between the government and the opposition, they said. So now there is a high liberalization forum, but it was ended without uh, any agreement uh, 22nd May 2018, and there are three major points for the negotiation now. One is the governance between the current system versus federalism, which uh, opposition you know, claim I demanded. And also there's a power sharing problem about who controls that po what position in the international government. And also third is a security sector arrangement. And that uh, James Morgan in South Ambassador again claimed to me in this February that South Sudan's government want to inclusive process, but rebels want to exclude us even in the traditional government, according to the South Sudanese government official. But at the same time, uh, opposition leader like Thomas Wanka, leader of the National Salvation Front, told me that the government is not serious about peace. You know, we should have fundamental changes in the governance, including introduction of federalism and security sector uh, reform in the liberalization forum. So it's still very challenging. And uh, there's a big contrast of the observation for the others. South Sudanese government argued that the Labour have no confidence to win the parliament elections, so they want to obtain the government by political negotiation, not through the elections. But the opposition argued that the government is afraid that if they lose absolute power in the traditional government, they will lose the election, lose access to the resource, including oil revenue, and might be punished. So they could lose almost everything. So I think uh, this situation is quite fit with my first argument that it, exclusion could happen when one side or both sides are afraid that if they, were, if they included enemy in the political process, then they would be defeated and marginalized and even could be punished. So it's, I think, vital for credible mediator like IGAD to assert security participation in the inclusion of the Europe Coalition Party to the process. If there is some hope on the South Sudan peace process, I found that civil war in the South Sudan is very fighting over the power and the resources. So maybe there is no fundamental ideological differences. Everybody embraced democratic election to choose a leader, for instance. So once conflict party obtain confidence about security, participation, and inclusions, uh, it might be possible for them to make some agreement and implement peace process, although I'm not so uh, optimistic. 
Uh, in terms of civil in the silver, I think everyone knows very well. That, you know, it started in 2011, and the Russian mi military intervention started in 2015. So there's dramatic changes in the military balance of the Syria. The red one is the government, and the green one is the opposition. But as you can see, in the last three years, there's a huge expansion of the you know government territories. But uh, when I conduct a, a field research in 2017, 2018 for five weeks each, I interviewed many people, including Stefan de Mitsua, UN Special Member for Syria. And he told me that I'm not naive to tell that there's no possibility of the military end. However, if there's no political solution, chronical insurgency would be continued, uh, according to Stefan. So the logic by UN Special Envoy is actually to persuade the Syrian government to accept historical lesson that excluding certain political group, a uh, Sunni group in the case of Syria, is very likely to result in the relapse of the conflict. So it's fit with my third argument that it's crucial for the peace agreement to have some component to ensure the inclusions. And uh, it comes from the lesson of such as like Afghanistan and Iraq. So I went to the Iraq this uh, February to have individual discussion with three vice presidents of Iraqi to discuss you know challenge of the peace building in the Iraq, including like Maliki, Mr. Nujafi, and also Mr. Rawi, and also the head of the PKU, the you know Kurd parties. And I found that although there are strategic differences on how to obtain the political powers, there seems to be some kind of consensus that Iraqi need to overcome sectarian politics and establish national identity as Iraqi after 15 years civil conflict and the threat of the ISIS. Um, so in the conclusions, uh, South Sudan has been struggling on the how to restore the inclusive process. So it show how it could be challenged to restore the inclusivity. The Syrian government might be confident about the military victory now, but history suggests the risk and the fragility of the strategies. And uh, in terms of Iraq, after political exclusion, Iraq has been struggling for 15 years to overcome sectarian politics. And now they have a you know, crucial moment after the national election on May 12 about whether or not they can create some, some kind of sustainable peace. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Thank you. Dr. Higashi, thanks very much for starting us off. And um, I think in a way that's a it's a very good segue into our, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Connor Sale, who recently co-wrote a book, Governance for Peace, How Inclusive, Participatory, and Accountable Institutions Promote Peace and Prosperity, which argues that including all significant groups in society in governance and economic activity is a key element of sustaining peace. So Connor, if maybe you could share some insights from your research, please. Excellent, thank you. Um, yes, hello, good afternoon. Uh, as Jake said, my name is uh, Connor Seil. I'm the director of OEF Research, which is a program of the One Earth Future Foundation. One Earth Future is an operating foundation that works to promote good governance in the interest of peace, and OEF Research is our think tank program that works to support that mission, and more broadly, to promote evidence-based practice in peace and security. So to accomplish that goal, uh, we have recently released a book through Cambridge Press uh, that represents our attempt to come to grips with what a question of evidence-based practice in peace and security actually looks like. It reviews the empirical literature surrounding um, good governance and how it connects to sustainable peace. And my remarks today are going to be driving from that book. I'd be happy to answer questions uh, afterwards. And we also have some flyers available at the back with a discount if you're interested in learning more about the book itself. So the focus of this discussion is on inclusivity. And indeed, when we review the empirical research on sustainable peace, we find that inclusivity is persistently, across multiple studies and multiple contexts, found to be a critical element of sustainable peace, um, to the point where we would argue it's one of the four key pillars of what good sustainable peace looks like, alongside uh, participatory systems, whether democratic in form or some other form, so that people feel that their voice is being included in the system accountable government, so that government operates according to some shared understanding about rules or procedures applied to all, uh, and state capacity, particularly capacity to deliver economic development, human development, and social services such as education and health care, and also security capacity, the presence of a robust enough police and military that spoilers and uh, strongmen don't come in and just kick over the anthill. 
When all four of these conditions are present, um, I would argue that the empirical literature suggests that the result is a sustainable system. They often tend to co-occur. We like to say that all good things go together. And in fact, when they are all present, the uh, system appears to be able to recover from external shocks or potential flashpoints for conflict. On the converse, when none are present, the result is a seriously challenged system where attempts to develop one of these pillars in isolation of the others may be undermined and not sustainable because of the absence of the other pillars. So with that as the framing, let's talk specifically about inclusion, the focus of this event. Um, briefly, what I would argue the research says about why inclusion is important drives from political science and conflict studies understanding of the root causes of violence. Over the past 20 or 30 years, there's been um, a framing used in the conflict literature, a, a simplification, but I think a, a useful framing to understand the root causes of conflict is relating to either greed or grievance. That is to say, violent groups take up arms when they feel that there is something that they can get through violence, whether it's economic resources, natural resources, or political power. Um, or when they feel that they are righting some perceived wrong, addressing some insult or historical grievance caused by some other group. The pendulum has swung over the last 20 years about which of these is more important. I would argue that increasingly the consensus is that they both matter. Maybe some are more important at the elite level, some are more important for popular mobilization, but both greed and grievance seem to play a significant role in creating the preconditions for violence to erupt. Through that framing, it's easy to see why inclusivity is important. Inclusivity addresses both. To the extent that all relevant identity groups in the society feel that they are able to access the resources being provided by the government or by that society, greed is lessened because they are able to access the resources being provided by the group, and grievance is lessened, at least theoretically, because they feel that they may be able to access the system or are being treated equally within it. Um, so, the literature would tend to suggest that inclusivity is a critical part of undermining the root causes of conflict, most specifically when it's accomplished in the context of the other pillars as well. What does this mean for the specific activity of the UN and the international organizations present in this room? Well, in the context of peace building operations, uh, it does suggest that local ownership may be important for all the reasons that Dr. Higashi laid out. To the extent that peace building operations are seen as incorporating the relevant identity groups in an area, the legitimacy of those operations may be supported. However, I think that the critical recommendations from our book have less to do with the practice of the operations themselves and more the question of what kind of system are those operations intended to support. The creation of sustainable peace needs to be geared towards the creation of an inclusive system where all of the relevant identity groups in the society feel that they are being represented in the decisions of the group, of the, the government or the governance system as a whole, and are able to access the resources provided by that government. To the extent that they perceive themselves to be excluded, and I need to underscore that, the perception is more important than the reality, because what matters is the ability of these groups to make an argument to mobilize people to attend, to, to, to turn out. So to the extent that they perceive themselves as being incorporated into the system in perpetuity, sustainable peace is more likely. The other point that I would like to make is one other thing to consider in the context of inclusivity. A lot of the discussion around inclusivity relates to local ownership and in the engagement of groups within a society. And as I've discussed, that's critical. It's, it's consistently seen to be a core predictor of peace. However, as I've also said, that's true when a governance system is able to deliver a wide array of social goods, of security capacity, in a participatory manner that also operates according to principles of good governance, accountability, transparency, et cetera. Peace building operations need to be geared towards the creation of systems that accomplish all four of these pillars simultaneously. So in considering inclusivity, I would argue that we need to be thinking about inclusivity as defined with local ownership and engagement at the level of the society. We also need to be thinking about horizontal inclusivity, inclusivity of all the different groups operating in development and peace building support. Now, the UN knows this. It's a key aspect of the security of the, of the, uh, the Secretary General's report on sustaining peace. It's a key aspect of the integrated missions and integrated assessment and planning approach to peace building operations. But I also think it's fair to say that in practice, it's a very difficult thing to accomplish. 
um, the differing cultures of the different UN entities, the different civil society organizations, the private sector actors operating in these spaces can lead to challenges in truly integrating uh, multidimensional peace building operations in a truly integrated way. And I'd like to argue that in considering inclusivity, the focus needs to be on creating an inclusive, sustainable society moving forward. And in accomplishing that, we should also be considering horizontal inclusivity, inclusivity of all the different array of actors engaged in um, development, political support, and peacekeeping operations in a coordinated fashion. Again, I realize that we're not the first ones to say this, but uh, it's also the case that I think that there is more to be done in that area, and it's worth continuing to put a call for this kind of coordinated activities. Thank you. Thanks, Connor. It, it, I think that's a, a great segue to our next speaker, um, Hassini Hapitantri. Sri Lanka, of course, is emerging from a, a very long, very bloody civil war. And the research that you did as part of the IPI series has looked at the experience of two local women's organizations operating in, in the, the peace building space. So it would be incredibly interesting in, the, in a way to bring this down to a very concrete example and hear a bit about what you found in, in Sri Lanka in terms of um, how to ensure greater inclusivity and peace building, but also what this means for how the international community approaches peace building. Yeah, so thank you, Jake, for having me here. Um, so um, I think we all agree and know that lack of inclusivity um, in peace building, especially in post-conflict peace building situation, results in a relapse to conflict uh, in a fairly quick manner. Uh, and like you say, Sri Lanka is yet another example of that. But today, I actually want to go beyond Sri Lanka to the very local level um, and draw uh, some insights from my own experience as, as a peace builder uh, for the last 12 years on the ground, um, especially in ensuring inclusivity at the very local level. When we are working in global structures um, that um, like the UN or International Development Cooperation. And I'm titling this little input as voicing the unvoiceable, ensuring uh, inclusivity at local level for sustaining peace. So um, just to get us all on the same page, let me try to give you an uh, idea of what Sri Lanka has been through for the last 50 to 30 years in 60 seconds. Um, so as you all know, we emerged from the conflict in 2009, uh, what is famously known as an identity conflict between two groups. Uh, this is the uh, Sinhalese majority and the Tamil minority. But there are also other groups in this conflict that we are not always sensitive to, um, like the Muslim community, for uh, example. Um, and uh, the conflict has come to an end in a rather heartbreaking manner. You know, it's not the case study you want to look at if you want to uh, think of conflict resolution in the peaceful means, but it was a military victory that uh, solved the conflict at the end of the day. But moving on, now we have peace. We have a lack of armed conflict, which brings a lot of opportunities. But despite the uh, consistent engagement of the international community in the reconciliation processes and the rhetoric of the government uh, um, you know, uh, at, after the regime change that we had in 2015, we are still struggling to ensure uh, peace at the very local level. Um, and this is a, uh, an example was um, the anti-Muslim riots that we experienced in March, um, which were not no longer between governments and groups. You know, this is people taking to the roads and attacking people. So this is about peace building at the very local level, right? So I want to take a moment uh, to discuss the Muslim community because it's not just an issue in Sri Lanka, it's a global uh, phenomenon and and in Sri Lanka they were sandwiched in the 30-year war between the two parties and famously evacuated by the LTTE back in the 1990s. Uh, but in fact, uh, I would argue that um, you know 
the first race riots actually happened in then Ceylon against the Muslims by the Sinhalese, backed by the British government also that we were a colony at the time, back in 1915. So actually, although the reason conflict was between the Tamil and the Sinhalese, uh, I would even say, you know, the, 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 the anti-Muslim sentiments were so deep-seated, insidious, um, and predates anti-Tamil sentiments, not unlike the rest of the world. So when we are talking about reconciliation after the conflict in this situation, we are not just talking about two groups. We are talking about an entire community that is so diverse. And how do we bring all that, uh, all those people into uh, an idea of reconciling and sharing an island? So that's the framework we are uh, talking about today. But the particular example or the story that I'm going to share with you today is going to complicate even this understanding or this framework. Um, and, um, you know, actually, um, uh, um, it's a tricky story to tell. And I don't know how well it'll go down with this audience, but I trust you will take it in the right spirit. So um, the example is from a small town called Puttalam, which is in the northwest of Sri Lanka. This was back in 2006, and I was a very young program officer working for an international development cooperation project backed by a European government. And we wanted not just to work with the government, we wanted to involve local communities. And we especially wanted to work with the Muslim community that was internally displaced in the 90s and who was still living in the camps in 2006. And um, in the classic tradition that we go about such interventions, we started with a conflict analysis, all right? Uh, that's how we do it. So um, we went to Portland, we invited the government officials, civil society organizations, we invited a, a group of Muslim women, tick the box, inclusion of marginal groups, right? And we invited them to identify the tensions in their community. Now, the Muslim women, again and again, among other things, started bringing up an issue about a woman who was causing conflict in their community, right? Now, this woman uh, was a sex worker, right? Let's call her Maya for this purpose here today. So Maya, by the way, was a Sinhalese woman from the IDP community, uh, sorry, the host community, the majority host community, who had a clientele from the IDP Muslim community. And the Muslim men were, of course, married to naturally the Muslim women who were in our group, right? Um, of course, all these details and background we found later because the moment we heard the word sex worker, we said, this is a peace building project, right? So when we asked for the women to prioritize, they came up again and again, but you know, the senior program officer and myself at that at that point, we were convent educated women from capital Colombo. We were not ready to feature Maya in our conflict analysis, right? So we got the women to prioritize um, differently. And now I actually don't even remember what those issues were. But we prioritized and we developed a project based on uh, those issues together with the women's group. So again, tick the box, participatory project design. Right, um, And we happily supported the project for the next three years. We wrote wonderful reports with beautiful photographs. We achieved the indicators on time. Everything was perfect. <coughs> three years later, an evaluation mission comes. And the evaluator asks the women's group a question. So tell me about a recent conflict in your community and how you resolved it. A woman gets up and starts talking about Maya, right? She was saying, you know, we were struggling with this for such a long time, and finally, we found a solution. We cooperated with the Sinhalese community and got rid of Maya and chased her out of the village. So these wise Muslim women from the IDP community cooperated with the host majority community, networked, and got Sinhalese thugs to attack Maya's house and burn it down. After all those workshops we've had with them, 
on nonviolent conflict resolution, right? And anyway, uh, fortunately, Maya escaped with her child, and she went to another woman's group who supported her. And the story continues, but this is enough for our purpose here today, because I want to uh, just uh, take the lessons from this. You know, so what did we do wrong? Where did we go? And there were so many, so many things that I learned out of that experience. But I want to leave with you three key uh, points. So the first is when we go into a local situation with predefined frameworks. Uh, and we try to bring in external resources into a local context, finances, know-how, technology, anything, without a sufficient understanding of the historical social context and an understanding of the local dynamics at the moment, it's not inclusion, it's not local ownership, it's not sustaining peace. And if we are honest in day-to-day -day international development cooperation, peace building projects, let's admit it, this is what we do most of the time, if not always. My second point is that inclusion takes trust. And trust takes time. You know, We can't go into a community, do a conflict analysis, and expect that that is really the roadmap to go ahead with this community in helping them, you know? And given the time frames that we are working with, for example, two to three years of peace building projects, and given the project delivery architecture, the approach that we work with, uh, with our indicators, with our log frames, with, uh, you know, all of that, the result chain, um, to cut a sh long story short, there is no space for any of this. Third lesson for me is that you know, inclusion has to happen on an equal footing. Uh, so it's not just about getting a, like an ethnic group that's out there to coexist with another ethnic group that's you know, living in the. We are also implicated in that context the moment we go and start talking to them, right? So inclusion is also about how we, the educated of the world, who create these structures for supporting local communities to nurture peace uh, and drive these structures. It's about how we also see eye to eye with the communities that we work with. So if we cannot see eye to eye with a sex worker, with an ex-combatant, with a terrorist, if we don't go beyond those labels and you know, nurture um, their ideas and opinions, include, including that, um, then it's difficult to talk about all these things we are talking about right now. So I mean, ultimately, in summing, summing up, I mean, um, I think it's, it has to begin with us uh, recognizing our own blind spots and working within our own peace building community in transforming our mindsets and the architecture, the project architecture, and the, the global structures we are putting in place uh, to sort of make people able to voice what they feel at the moment is unvoiceable in front of us. People who are not like us, you know, how do they feel comfortable to voice what they feel is unspeakable or unvoiceable at the moment? So, I mean, and we all agree that marginal groups should be included. And so far, we've only been ticking the boxes. And let's discuss how we go beyond that. And I hope that we can come back to it in, uh, in the key one a So thanks for being a great audience. And for all those who are celebrating the blessed month, Ramdan Karim. Thank you. Thanks very much, Asini. So we have about half an hour for Q&A before um, I reserve some time to invite Ambassador Kawamura, uh, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Japan, to make some closing remarks. And I th before opening things up to the floor, I wanted to ask the three of you a question, which is that all of you have highlighted how inclusive 
political processes promote more durable peace. And I think in, in many of the countries facing risk of, of armed violence or coming out of, uh, in some cases, decades of conflict, whether Sri Lanka or many of the cases that you mentioned, um, we've seen uh, host governments that are often extremely sensitive about issues of national sovereignty, uh, concerns about internationalization of, of, of the conflict, uh, this idea that ending up on the agenda of the Security Council is anathema, um, a wave of crackdown on civil society organizations in, in a number of places, and often deliberate marginalization of, of particular groups. So I'd be curious for your thoughts on what some of the entry points are in such contexts to begin to gradually move uh, the discussion towards more inclusive uh, processes. Um, so keep that in mind, and um, and why don't we why don't we take a couple questions from from the floor as well? And if you could please introduce yourself, please. Can you just sorry wait for the microphone? Oh. Uh, my name is Ram Chalori. I am from Princeton uh, International Committee for Peace and Reconciliation. Uh, I came a little late, so I don't know if you covered it or not. Do you have uh, any ideas to how we can resolve the Rohingya uh, issue in uh, Myanmar? Any other questions? All right, well, uh, please. Hi, um, Albert Golson. There was a recent agreement uh, facilitated by um, President uh, Macron um, with respect to the Libyan um, various groups. I think there was one group that was not included. However, there were three other groups that were. They did come to uh, a verbal agreement with respect to um, uh, the sort of uh, unified government late in the year as well as elections. Could you elaborate on the success possibly of either verbal agreements, uh, how quickly would those go to, for example, a signed agreement and the possibility of success that um, to form a unified government in Libya or under similar circumstances elsewhere. All right, why don't we come back to the panel, if, uh, Dr. Higashi, if you wanna respond to any of those questions. Yeah, thank you very much for great questions. Uh, in terms of the, your questions about what is the entry point for the international community to in, you know, increase uh, inclusivities, I really think that it's very important for the like a peace builder or international actor to recognize that excluding some political group is very dangerous. Uh, now it becomes almost a common sense for us that uh, maybe we need to have an inclusive process, but uh, when we think of, when I started studying uh, peace building in 2004 or 2005, we don't see that kind of uh, rhetoric so much. Uh, to be honest, when the Iraqi started the nation building in 2003, the exclusion of the Sunni was almost a natural thing for them. Uh, in terms of the Afghanistan peace buildings, uh, excluding the Taliban from the peace process is a quite, quite, a, quite, quite a ordinary, <laughs> a very normal, normal thing for, for them. When I worked for the Inama in 2010, I tried to, I was a team leader for reconciliation, so I tried to unite many different actors in the United States, international communities, the United Nations, ISAF, and also Afghan government to have a same page, uh, to have a unified strategy to include the Taliban into the political process. And at least we created like a high peace council, international reconciliation trust fund. But until 2010, it was very difficult for us to have any unified ideas or consensus about whether or not we should include the Taliban into the political process. So I think the first thing that we should do is to recognize that it's very dangerous or risky to exclude some political group or identity, identity groups. This is the first thing. In terms of the entry point to the second things, I really fully agree with uh, Ms. or Dr. Hapu-Tantri that it's very important, crucial to have understanding about local dynamics. Without understanding local dynamics and the political groups or, or, or political mapping, it's almost impossible. 
to think about how to support uh, inclusion or how to support kind of inclusive committee or inclusive uh, process in that place in that place so I think one of the things that we can think of using a resource for example peace building fund or you know, some kind of peace building fund or related fund is to support those kind of investigations about local dynamics and to support some you know a dialogue or, or, or a mechanism of the, of, of the political inclusion. I think uh, funding an investigation or research is very minor or it's not so popular in the UN funding, but I think it's very critical. It's not, it's not for my own research, but, <laughs> but it's, I think it's very critical to have those kind of components. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I think that both questions, well, the, the question about the verbal peace building, I, I, I don't feel I know enough to speak to, so just set that aside for the moment. The question about the, the situation with the Rohingya and this question about how do we deal with state resistance to engage in this conversation, I think I may have one comment to make that speaks to both of these issues, which is that uh, I agree with, with Dr. Higashi 100%. One valuable point of entry may be stressing the fact that this conversation can, can start from a moral standpoint or a normative standpoint, um, or it can start from a very empirical standpoint about how risky exclusion is. I think that the dominant conversation around inclusion right now is framed in normative language, which makes it easy for a ruling junta to say, I'm driving from a different moral standpoint. I don't accept the foundational argument that for moral reasons we need to include all members of the society, or maybe we do, but these people don't count for whatever reasons. I think that um, an alternate point of entry is simply to say, well, regardless of your moral feeling about it, it is quite dangerous to exclude people, not only because it creates the seed for future conflict, but because it may undermine the legitimacy of the government as a whole. Um, for some discussions, that's going to be a more useful point of entry than, than others. But the other valuable point about that point of entry is in the case with the Rohingya, I know that the government dismisses the identity of the Rohingya themselves. Say, oh, well, they, they don't acknowledge the existence of, of the Rohingya as a people. And again, from an empirical standpoint, it frankly doesn't matter whether you acknowledge the existence of this group or not. What matters is whether there exists a set of people who identify with some group that can be the seed of some kind of pushback, resistance, or, or, or dispute. Um, the situation in Myanmar is, is, is particularly acute because even in that case, I'm not sure that the empirical argument, the pragmatic argument, is going to work because the government is in such a dominant position that they can just say, OK, well, we'll continue a policy of complete removal in order to prevent the potential threat. So I don't want to present that as a specific solution to Myanmar although it, some element of it may be part of a framing of the conversation that may allow the government to engage more openly than if it's seen as part of a larger normative discourse that they just simply reject as a Western imposition. Yeah, thank you. I, I would also uh, try to respond to the question of uh, uh, national sovereignty, because what you just uh, explained uh, was the classic uh, description of what was happening in our uh, situation as well. So I, I think the issue is that um, there are so many levels that we are talking about here, like uh, Dr. Kigash was saying. And, and we have to engage all those levels and making sure that we include uh, some groups at a particular level does not really automatically mean that the rest of it is, you know, in place. So it's it's really about how do you build, um, you know, peace or sustain peace from within, you know, the bottom-up approach we so much talk about. Uh, because even the way that the governments uh, react or the governments work with the international community, you know, th th again, it's about equality you know it doesn't happen on a platform of equality when sri lanka is brought forward and put on the spot and asked it's an unequal situation and and 
we have to twist and turn and all of that, right? And that's why we ask why hasn't it uh, progressed so much even after the uh, uh, the, the, uh, the the former government, which was which we thought was the issue. Why isn't it uh, any better now? That's the issue because it's not equal. Um, and the, the structures within the country hasn't changed, although governments have changed, right? So unless we really start addressing all levels of peace building, it's difficult. I know it's really tough. It's easy to um, say it. It's easy to theorize it. It's easy to do peace on paper. Um, but um, it's really difficult to build that up, bottom up, step by step. And un unless you address those levels of violence, which are really deep-rooted, inbuilt structures of violence that are present in societies day to day, that you are reflected in the institutions, in the governance structure, in the accountability. You know, all of that is so deep-rooted. And you, if you don't start addressing that, then um, we just have this power play of governments talking to other governments and coming into agreements and you know and and in the end it is not an eventually a resolution of a conflict thank you before the the session started we were speaking a little bit about how sri lanka is also grappling with uh, radical buddhism and I, and i wonder not to put you on the spot but um maybe if if you have any insights from Sri Lanka's own experience that might be applicable to what we're seeing in, in Myanmar. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not a matter of what religion or what ethnicity it is, you know? So um, uh, it's true. Now, for the West, you can't put together Buddhism and violence. But here it is. In Sri Lanka, you have Buddhist fundamentalism. Uh, and as in um, in Myanmar, so I don't want to talk so much about Myanmar because my knowledge of it is not uh, sufficient to talk to an audience uh, uh, like this. But in the case of Sri Lanka, uh, what happens is that the the more radical uh, form, uh, groups they mobilize more. You know, they they mobilize more. I always wonder why is it. It's not the peace camp that's the best on social media, uh, that's the best in mobilizing people. I mean, they are so much better than all of us, you know, despite the fact we have the money, we have the support of the international community, we have the know-how we believe, but they are so much better at it, so much better at organizing, getting that video clip that goes viral, and, you know, getting people out. But the thing is, you know, that's, I think they talk to the people's needs, um, which we are still not failing to recognize because we come with certain frameworks. Uh, and that, that is the issue, Jake, I really think. you know. So if we actually try to sit and talk to them, I mean, I, I, I really try to talk to the other side. You know, I mean, like Dr. Higashi was saying, most of the peace building work that's happening with civil society and government in Sri Lanka now excludes the other, mm. right? It's preaching to the converted. We all uh, come together and talk. It's wonderful stuff, and it has a, a benefit, but it is not exclude, it, including people who are different than us, right? So we need to sit down with those young people who are feeling alienated, uh, who are having issues of having a purpose in life. And then whether it's the, the Muslim or the Buddhist or Christian that comes and gives them a purpose and says, let's go and do this, they go and do it. That's how it happens. And then governments are in, uh, you know, try to retaliate. And we've had cycles and cycles of violence where our government tried to crush the Sinhalese youth, the Tamil youth, and Muslim youth. So it comes again and again. Um, and I think that's the issue. All right, we have uh, about 15 minutes for more questions. I have one in the front and then one in the back. Uh, Ambassador Subhan from Bangladesh. Uh, I've actually been dealing with the Rohingya issue now for 40 years. The first major exodus took place back in 1978. I was in the government, the director general in the foreign ministry directly dealing with this. When I look back, 
uh, and compare recent events to what happened uh, 40, years, 40 years ago. One major significant new development is the role of social media and fake news. Uh, what we've seen uh, in stoking the fires in Myanmar uh, against uh, not only the Rohingyas, but also Muslims in general, and indeed Bengalis and Bangladeshis, uh, has been the role of, of social media and the spread of fake news. And we saw this also in the case of the riots in, in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, would the panel care to comment, how do we address this, this problem, which I think is, is now a huge problem? Um, hello, I am Jamal Msami of um, the African Policy Circle and the um, Conrad Adenauer Foundation. Um, just a quick question to the entire panel. Um, how do you begin promoting inclusivity when seemingly one of the reasons driving conflict seems to be um, rooted in the um, zero conceptions of the zero sum conceptions of power? Um, hello, my name is Nini Oke Uche. I'm a minister with the Nigerian Mission. When we talk of inclusivity and peace building, we tend to talk about different parties coming together or different sectors like civil society, private sector. I also see the educated and the uneducated because most of us here are really educated, so we understand these concepts. And even among us, we have problems defining some of these terms. So when you now go into a country and you're trying to build peace or sustain peace, the masses are the vulnerable people who, if someone wanted to drive conflict, would target. So even if you have all the elite at the top understanding why you need peace, when the masses don't, what happens? Because you've told us here that um, you need to understand what's happening locally. You need to understand the history of the conflict. That's a lot of study, which can be done. But how much education is given to the less educated people so that when you come in as a team of, uh, for peace building, you're not just seen as, I come from Nigeria, which is a developing country. We were colonized years ago. So sometimes when you have foreigners coming in, you're like, what do they want now? Is it our oil? Is it our gold? And they're almost like the enemy. So how do you prepare the people for the peace builders when they come in to already understand why they're coming and what they're coming for and the benefit of what they're bringing and to be able to differentiate that when it's from the UN, so to speak, you know, they don't have anything to gain. <laughs> the gain is world peace. So it's all good and well when we understand what's happening, but then the people at the lower level need to understand as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Melody Mirzaga with the Baha'i International Communities UN office. First of all, thank you so much to the panel for um, your very thoughtful insights and the lessons of you you've, you've learned and shared with us today. I'm grateful that the conversation here has kind of gone beyond thinking about political mechanisms for inclusion and has included uh, consideration of the role of trust um, coming at inclusivity from on unequal footing um, and some of the other things that, that were mentioned by the panel. And based on some of the questions and building off of them, I have my, my other question is what, is, what is required by those external actors in terms of how they view the local people? Um, do we see the local people as uneducated or do, do we assume that there is inherent capacity that exists in, in that local community and that that local community has much to offer not only in terms of their intimate knowledge of the local circumstances, but also their ability to contribute to creating peace from within, as I believe was said on the panel. Thank you. Uh, okay, we'll take one more and then we'll come back to the panel. Uh, just in the middle here. Hello, my name is Bashir, I'm from the United Nations. As you know, uh, most member countries of the United Nations are undertaking a reform process of the whole United Nations, and in particular, the Security Council. Do you think the very structure of the UN right now 
especially the composition of the Security Council and the use or perhaps abuse of veto powers is an impediment uh, and a challenge to the inclusivity that we are discussing here. Great, thanks, Dr. Gashi. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your great uh, comment and uh, questions. I fully agree with the comment by the gentleman that the uh, role of the social media is getting very crucial. Uh, and it's also created a lot of challenge. When I went to Iraq, I heard that uh, many Shia people share the information only with the Shia people by social media. Uh, and uh, Sunni people only share the, you know, their suffering of the attack by the Shia with the, with the, with the Sunni people by social media. So only if people who have the uh, same identity tend to share the information now by the, by, the, by the social media, and it creates huge challenges for them to have some mutual understanding and reconciliation, I think. So in order to overcome it, uh, one of the important projects that maybe Peace Building Fund or you know, United Nations can support is to create kind of public uh, broadcasting corporation or public TV, TV networks. Uh, it's not because I came from that you know, Japanese public TV company, but I believe that it's so crucial for some neutral, uh, trusted uh, broadcasting corporation to, to, to share the information to, across uh, different ethnicity, identity group, and the political groups, and also maybe tribe groups. So in the South Sudan, uh, Japanese International Cooperation Agency tried to create or support you know, creation of the very public uh, TV networks in the South Sudan. And I think that those kind of effort is quite crucial, uh, not only to overcome the you know, division created by social media, also, but, but also to educate the people that um, Nigeria uh, colleague mentioned. Uh, it's very crucial for us to, to, to nature or mature the peoples about why it's important for them to have some understanding with others and to have some kind of uh, maturity to, to accept the people who you might not like it. Or you, 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 so I think of creating that or supporting creation of the, those kind of in, in institution is, is, quite, is quite crucial. In terms of the zero sum of assumptions, it's also about like a, you know, mindset issues. Japan also used to think before World War II that it's kind of zero sum game, that, so that we need to have a fight against China to, 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 to maintain the territories. But now we have a totally different assumption that it's possible to have a kind of mutual benefit, a mutual uh, development, uh, even if we don't expect, you know, expand the territory itself. So I think uh, uh, if South Sudan create a peace, I'm sure that the, we, they create so much benefit using the like oil revenue and so much you know, potential of the agriculture so that it creates more pie for everybody of the South Sudan. So it's not zero sum game. It can increase more benefit for all of the peoples in the South Sudan, but it's so crucial to change that kind of mind mindset of the zero sum, zero sum, zero sum assumption, I think. Mm, it, maybe I, can, I need to finish here. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, with regards to the question of, of social media, I think that there is probably, there are very few questions I think that are more concerning than the increasing role of social media as a mobilization tool for extremism and violence, to me personally. That, um, if I had a good answer to it, then my role here would be to talk about that rather than this larger um, research because I think that it is increasingly visible as a problem, but it's not obvious what the solution is. I am personally skeptical to some degree of counter-messaging campaigns, um, which is one tool that's been used, because I think that there's research from many different contexts. I mean, you can just think about um, drug use in the United States that shows that what matters is the social attitudes much more than kind of public communications. Um, I do think that the work that Safaricom did in Kenya, filtering violence-promoting messages, probably did contribute to peace in Kenya in the lead-up to the, to the, um, the election in, in 2012 and 13. But that then opens a very dangerous can of worms around censorship and 
the potential misuse of those tools. So I don't know that there's a good answer to it. Um, I think that the best answer that I'm aware of right now is a transparent and open discussion with the telecommunications providers about what they're doing to prevent their tools from being used for the promotion of um, extremism or, or, or violence. But I think this also underscores one, uh, a separate question, which is, again, the idea that what matters is the perception of exclusion or the perception of some abuses by another group more than the reality. Um, I think frequently it's easier to tell the truth than a lie. I think that there is a fundamental correspondence between the general perceptions and the reality, but they're not the same thing. And in considering inclusion, I think that people interested in promoting peace and security should absolutely focus on the reality because there will be a foundational relationship between that reality and uh, what the perception is, but they should also be aware of the perception and how that perception can be used or misused. In terms of the question of um, what does this mean in a context where politics is perceived as zero sum, I think that this is the foundational issue, both for issues of greed and grievance to the extent that politics is zero sum or is seen as zero sum, there is an foundational driver for conflict. Either groups feel that when they are voted out or leave power, they are going to not have any access to resources or benefits, or they're going to be punished for their, 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 um, their, their abuses in the past. The result is naturally that they tend to cling to power. But the problem is, is that clinging to power then creates a perception of exclusion and perception of grievance by whatever group is not included in it. I think that to the extent that systems are zero-sum or are perceived as zero-sum, this is in and of itself a driver of conflict, and that should be something which should be the focus of international or local work in that community, is, is simply changing the perception of the reality of the political system uh, around that issue specifically. Um, and then in terms of the question of the structure of the UN, you know, similarly what I would say there is any governance system, whether city, town, local, region, national, or, or international, that easily lends itself to a story that says that some group is being excluded or that some other group has formal authority that is not shared more broadly, um, that makes it very easy to create a story which challenges the legitimacy of that institution. Um, and I think that certainly in the case of UN reform, the question of how inclusive is the system and how cleanly can that story be told it becomes an important question. Yeah, I mean, I know uh, both of you have also talked about it, um, the, the social media issue, but just because um, when the anti-Muslim riots broke out in Kandy uh, and the social media was playing such a big part, uh, the government cracked down on social media. So it banned uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, all of that for for about a week, we had to go without it. So now, this is a classic example of a society that has not prepared for such a situation. And we are only reacting when things happen, right? So I think, like, uh, like you say, it's not uh, easy to come out with an answer, but the answer is in the area where we are not reacting to situations. And we start by thinking of how do we address things long term, you know? Uh, and, and that, I think, is the issue. So let's break it down. Why, wh what, what's the root cause behind these social media campaigns? It's not that it cannot be contained. It's simply because societies are not literate enough or critical enough in their thinking and processing of, of uh, information. Like, world over, we are too media driven, right? We buy what is being said, which brings me to the uh, question and the comment that this lady uh, brought up uh, about education. You know, it's all fine when we are a, a, a group with certain capacities to deal and decode these messages, but the masses don't have that. So the answer is, how do we tackle the issue of, you know, building the capacities of masses to control themselves within, to build within. So that's the question, right? And, and it doesn't happen on a three-day workshop on peace building, which is what we are doing right now, right? So like, I think there are three areas that we need to look at seriously. 
Uh, one is education, long-term education. Uh, I think sustaining peace without looking at education seriously, uh, and especially teaching history differently, teaching culture differently, you know, these issues, we, we, we are not getting there, right? That's one area. Second area is media. Again, you know, how, what is our relationship to media and how much does we, do we allow media to drive us in moments of, uh, you know, emergency? Um, and um, sec third is, I think, culture, a culture that promotes inclusivity, respect uh, in the TV shows we watch, in the films we uh, wa uh, make, you know. I mean, I think those are areas that do not fall in peace building at the moment, you know. Uh, we, we don't look at these as peace building when we are talking about it in this context. So we need to broaden our concept uh, to look at areas which may look like it's beyond the negotiate uh, tables, but that's what really empowers communities to regulate and uh, build peace from within in the long run. And if I actually also connect that to uh, the question that uh, you raised from here about how do we approach a community from outside, uh, the whole divide between the educated and the uneducated, you know, I think it's about getting beyond the categories and the labels. Because when you say Muslim women's group, you already have an idea about it. Now, my example shows you that's not it. You cannot have a preconceived idea about what a Muslim group, women's group is in Sri Lanka. In, even if you know it, if it's in Sri Lanka, you don't know what, what it is in Putland. Right? So I think we need to really get beyond the categories that we have created for ourselves. I know there's a reason because we want to understand things. It's too complicated when everything is so unique and so specific. But it's fine to do this categorization for our understanding at this level, to have a discussion at this level. But when you are really implementing on the ground level, I think you really have to take in the specifics, like local wisdom, for example. How women embody local knowledges, women who do not write, who, can, who are not illiterate. What kind of knowledge do they bring that we can respect as educated people with PhDs? I think that is the question that we have to um, reflect. And it's not just enough reflecting it. it. We have to change the procedures, our architecture, our, our processes to accommodate that. Because we talk about it, but we don't really find mechanisms of practicing it. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it's all fine because I think it's, it's a long, uh, long-term uh, process. And we are having this discussion now. So I, I, I take that as quite positive. It, peace is not built in um, um, three-year projects. It's long-term. It's generational. Uh, so is social integration. And migration will teach you that it's generational. And uh, like Connor says, all good things go together. So we have to uh, work on that. Thank you. Just like, did you want to come back on, on one point? Yeah. yeah. Uh, final comment from my side is that uh, although we might have some consensus about inclusivity is quite important in the peacemaking, uh, I heard from many UN officials that it's actually inclusivity is more become more challenging compared with 20 years ago. It was easier for them to talk with, for example, opposition like Renato. Uh, which is very notorious for the, uh, the brutal actions, to start negotiation with them and try to include them to the, to the peace, peace uh, agreement process. Now, once some group are categorized as a terrorist group by so many different uh, lists of the uh, terrorist group, it became very difficult for the UN Special Envoy to start talking with them and to include them into the, to the nation building process. So now I'm uh, not practitioner, but uh, quite a little bit of you know free. Uh, I have freedom uh, in terms of uh, because I'm an independent academic. So I'd like to emphasize that maybe it might be good timing for the member state and for the international community to start at least some kind of discussion on giving some kind of freedom for UN special envoy to negotiate or to start talking with some 
some very brutal group. We have so many groups now, right? ISIL, you know, Boko Haram, and Al Shabaab. I'm not saying that we need to include all of them into the peace process, but I think we might need to try. We might need to start some try to include those people to the to, to the process if we try to create a sustainable peace. So uh, um, I think it's a good timing for us. And uh, maybe IPI could be the good institution to start this kind of a very controversial but very crucial and important discussion. So I sincerely appreciate uh, uh, you are giving us uh, this you know, critical you know, opportunities. And the, I hope uh, we can continue to have that discussion. So thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much. So let me um, now invite Dr. Uh, sorry, Ambassador Kawamura uh, to offer some brief concluding remarks. Ambassador, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, this is the hardest part of the uh, seminar like this, uh, to wrap up the uh, very diversified discussions with one uh, theme. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, IPI for hosting this very uh, meaningful uh, event and thank all the speakers uh, for their informative and valuable uh, contributions. By listening very carefully to this discussion, uh, it reminds me of the, the past discussion among the uh, UN member countries on the issue of the peace building, uh, what the root causes of the, uh, the conflict and how to prevent it, uh, uh, those causes. Um, one time last uh, November, we gathered in Green Trees and discussed uh, extensively for two days. And the theme was uh, quite opposite of today's. Uh, that was exclusion. No. Huh. The some uh, reporter uh, a, made a, a thesis that uh, exclusion uh, from social and economic uh, uh, factors and areas is the real root causes. Uh, of the uh, conflict. So the, the menu for uh, the uh, conflict prevention is to tackle this exclusion. In other words, that uh, well inclusion of those uh, different uh, groups of opinions and uh, positions uh, into the uh, political system uh, or other social economic systems is the key. Uh, so we discussed that uh, whether the economic opportunities like a job uh, was the, the main cause of the, uh, for, especially for the young people uh, running into the hands of the uh, terrorists or not. Uh, but our conclusion is that uh, the, the issue of root causes are multifaceted. Uh, what the exclusion could happen uh, in any country, in any time. Uh, for example, uh, job market. Uh, people could be excluded from the job market or education and election, uh, if they feel uh, they are excluded, uh, discriminated against by the others uh, for those fundamental rights of the people, then they may uh, differently uh, perceive the society, social systems. So um, eco all economic and social uh, uh, elements and chances uh, should be shared by those every part of the society. That was the, uh, the conclusion of those groups. So I think that with just following your discussions uh, from the another mm -hmm. opposite side of the uh, perspectives and very, very uh, useful. And I have uh, learned uh, a lot today. Uh, so for my part, I, I leave with a few key take, takeaways. Uh, for one thing, it is indis indispensable to include all relevant actors in peace building and sustaining peace, such as women, youth, civil society, and the private sector. I uh, would also like to underscore how regional actors, as uh, Dr. Hapsa and Tatri uh, mentioned in the uh, Sri Lanka context, how regional actors, regional uh, uh, societies can strengthen national and local capacity to absorb the necessity of peace building. So, to achieve long-term peace and development, uh, efforts to sustain peace must be locally led, nationally owned, regionally anchored, and internationally supported. Uh, we should avoid take uh, a rather high-hand approach to the local communities, 
ownership is quite important. Uh, we always underline the importance of ownership. The acceptance uh, by the local communities and countries is very important. Um, inclusivity must be ensured in all aspects, including social, economic, and political dimensions, as I mentioned in the beginning. Um, I'd also like to in inter uh, introduce the, our experience uh, last uh, November, if my memory is correct, uh, as a member of the Security Council, we went to uh, Sahel region, visiting each capital and met with the uh, political leaders. And some of the political leaders of this region uh, mentioned that uh, uh, they are facing a imminent challenge of uh, terrorism and attacks. So a uh, conflict uh, prevention is an uh, imminent, very uh, imminent uh, challenge. But at the same time, um, some of those leaders, the, those leaders uh, ex um, emphasize the importance of to work with um, the social and economic development. Uh, in other words, that the peace building effort should uh, go with hand in hand with the ongoing security measures. Um, so I think that uh, the inclusivity in peace building for effective peace building has a multifaceted uh, challenge and missions, uh, which might include uh, the education and economic opportunities, economic systems, religion and historical uh, perspectives. So all those uh, should be included in the uh, inclusivities uh, is considered. So overall, this event highlighted the importance of inclusivity in peace building and sustaining peace. And I believe uh, today's speakers have provided us with new insights uh, through their research that will broaden our understanding and inspire us in our work. Uh, the accumulation of uh, empirical studies and um, the experiences uh, based on the uh, local and regional uh, context is very important. Uh, so we'd like to uh, work closely with the, uh, the professors and the researchers and the IPI and other uh, UN bodies uh, to find out the best solution, better solution uh, for peace, keep peace building effort to be uh, quite productive and effective. With that, I would like to thank all once again the all the speakers and IPI, uh, and also uh, Host Child for the uh, introductory statement uh, of the today's seminar. Thank you so much again, and uh, I wish everyone a good afternoon. Let me just echo um, Ambassador Kawamura's uh, final statement and uh, thank all of our, our speakers um, and uh, my thanks again to the government of, government of Japan and to you, Ambassador, for uh, co-hosting this with us. And uh, let me wish you a good rest of the afternoon. Thanks very much.